I would like to request our honorable speakers for this session, Mr. Rene Van Berkel, officer in charge, UNIDO representative, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Dr. Taufik Elahi Chaudhry, Birbikram, energy advisor to the honorable prime minister, prime minister's office, isn't here with us today and has given his apologies. Mr. Mohammed Abul Kalam Azad, principal office, principal coordinator, SDGs, prime minister's office. Dr. Rubana Haq, president, Bangladesh garment manufacturers and exporter association, BGMEA. Mr. Jens Radzinski, head of regional collaboration center, RCC for Asia Pacific. And Mr. Pierre Boryasson, head of sustainability, global production, H&M group to please come up on stage and take their seats on the dais. Please note that like the other session, we will also conduct opinion polls during this session. The given identity card to you has a QR code printed at its back. You can scan the code and participate at the polls and ask questions to the speakers. Honorable moderator will announce the poll results after the plenary discussion. Mr. Rene Van Berkel, I'm giving the floor to you. I'll take this one. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, uh, kind introduction. And I think, uh, yes, uh, uh, we probably kept the biggest challenge uh, for the last because climate change has been highlighted as uh, the defining challenge for uh, the, this century, as the UN Secretary General said. Uh, so uh, we would like to discuss this uh, here. So I think that uh, we have a distinguished panel, and I would not like to uh, take too much time, but maybe I can share a few perspectives before I go and I would also like to maybe do the panel a little bit different than the, the earlier panels and I have uh, two or three specific questions for each of you so that we can have different perspectives more on the same topic. Uh, so maybe as, as a background, I, I represent UNIDO. UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. We basically, as we say now, we do industrialization that works for markets, for environment and for people. And that is very much in line with sustainability as we also see uh, discussed here. Uh, I think that low carbon is an integral part of the sustainability agenda and um, we see basically, globally speaking, and we can elaborate on that, four levers for change. And the best known are then, of course, energy efficiency and the change to renewables. But I would not like to uh, dismiss the two other ones, which I see as basically these dematerialization, so using less stuff and also closing of the material cycles. And in that sense, we just saw the presentation of this material flow analysis and so on. So in that sense, in our view, this uh, issue of low carbon is so intrinsically linked to circularity. Uh, energy efficiency, I think, though, is the uh, greatest progress so far. But, uh, and, uh, and as time and time uh, shows, there's still lots of potential. And I would like to elaborate on why is there still potential, if you have already done this for 10, 15 years, 20 years, still, every time we start looking, we find new opportunities. And I think uh, for those who have maybe followed the International Energy Agency, they came out, I think, two or three days ago, that the, the rate of energy efficiency improvements is actually dropping. So we, we, we had a long-term average of 1.5% energy efficiency improvements annually, and last year it was only 1.2%. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are actually calling for doubling from one and a half to three percent. So we have a globally the three percent club. So we, we need to look at, and I, I would like to uh, also ask the, the panel to look at uh, questions on how can we really accelerate this transition to energy efficiency, and in the the, uh, the the parallel to that also renewables and renewables. We have all our uh, kind of uh, perceptions on what renewables should look like. So is it PV on the rooftop? Is it uh, solar thermal, which can be providing the heat and, and the hot water for processing houses? Or are we looking at bio? Are we looking at uh, wind and other solutions? So many solutions. Uh, but I, I would like to maybe start with uh, Jens Radinsky, the head of the Regional Cooperation Center, because um, uh, there were the, uh, uh, the 
the fashion se uh, sector basically signed a charter to commit to climate action. And I would like to ask Jens, uh, basically, that uh, yes, the Paris Agreement has, uh, uh, and the SDGs at large cannot be just a UN or a government initiative. Climate action needs industry, and industry needs also climate action to develop. So the fashion industry charter is there an exemplary achievement, but can you explain a bit on how the charter works? If it's convened by the UN, how does this work then with industry leadership? And how do you see this spill over maybe to other sectors? So if the fashion industry is leading, how is this then going to other sectors? So maybe... Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much, Rene, for the introduction. And uh, hello, uh, panel members and um, participants. Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, join this panel. Um, as mentioned here by my UN colleague, um, I'm from the UNFCCC. Most of you may be aware of UNFCC, that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, in short, the UN Climate Change Secretariat. And um, yeah, besides supporting the negotiations of the countries, which was uh, our main function for a number of years, um, with the Paris Agreement, also the function of the Climate Change Secretariat has uh, increased a little bit, so we see ourselves now also as a, dr as a driver of uh, climate action and uh, increase on, of climate ambition. So um, it's been recognized by parties also with the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, and since then, uh, as you know, Paris Agreement was signed in 2015 and into force in uh, 2016, and we are now approaching the very important um, first area covered by, by the national determined contributions of countries starting in 2020 to 2030. So this is basically the start of the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And what uh, parties and uh, also uh, academia and uh, uh, private sector realizes the, the challenge is huge. Um, you've also mentioned why is there still so much potential? Why is there still so much um, to do in energy efficiency? I think for, for many years there's been a lot of talk about climate change and we are definitely moving uh, in the right direction. I mean, there's a lot of activities happening. Um, it's just maybe been underestimated that we are moving much too slow and that climate change is actually happening much faster and much extremer than um, people have thought. I think this has become very apparent also with last year's uh, 1.5 degree report from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which really proved um, that um, the goal of the Paris Agreement to the temperature goal to stay well below two degrees Celsius um, um, temperature increase is, is a very critical goal. Um, we must aim really as low as possible. 1.5 is the, is the declared goal. Um, and it makes a big difference whether, whether we stay at 1.5 or actually even exceed two. So, uh, that's it as an explanation. So we try to, to get um, everyone on board, um, not only governments, but private sector is really crucial, um, private sector initiatives and this climate action campaign um, that we're having. We also, uh, two years, almost two years back, um, convened stakeholders from um, fashion industries for dialogue in, in Bonn to see what kind of opportunities there is because there were activities here and there but maybe as a consolidated um, effort of the industry to move forward um, there was this, this dialogue and definitely uh, recognized that there was an appetite of the, of the industry to move forward. Uh, the discussion continued um, and eventually entered into the declaration of the charter, the uh, fashion industry charter for climate change uh, last year, uh, climate conference at COP in Katowice, um, where these uh, participants of the charter committed to a number of, of goals under the charter. Uh, I think the most um, apparent one is the um, 
is the reduction of 30% uh, greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 2030. So that's one of the goals, but there are others also um, to work on a pathway to a full uh, carbon neutral industry, um, which means, for example, from 2025 onwards, no more coal-powered coal uh, boiler installations. There's also some goals on transparency and reporting. Um, so um, this charter is, is actually an industry-driven charter. The UN and UN Climate Change is facilitating the work, but is entirely driven by the industry. I'm, I'm sure we have some of the participants. Uh, I know H&M is and others uh, of you are probably signatories of the charter. Um, the participants work in in uh, working groups which are facilitated by the UN. We also make sure that the dialogue happens in an inclusive way and that reporting and promotion of the outcome is, is um, done, but then um, it's entirely um, driven by the industry. You also wanted me to go on the spillover effect or have I used up my time already? <laughs> well, this is just one industrial sector. We're definitely aiming for other sectors to, uh, to follow. Um, fashion industry is a global industry, so that makes it uh, very important to work with you, and you're also known to be a very in innovative and, and uh, leading industry, so we definitely hope uh, of, of followership of uh, other industries, and we're, we're working on it. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So then I would like to go first to uh, Mr. Abu Kalam Azad, the principal coordinator for the SDGs from the Prime Minister's office. And I, th I think that uh, it, it's been said many times, the SDGs are basically multifaceted, and even I have gone and said, well, think of the SDGs as a, as a dice with 17 sides. So as soon as you start moving one side, the others will move. But if we zoom in as for climate action on SDG 13, so how is... Uh, how is Bangladesh faring in terms of planning for decarbonization of the economy and, and how, how is it then moving in terms of the, uh, what you see as the challenges for implementing of the NDC, which I understand is currently standing at 5% uh, below business as usual, without assistance and with assistance 15%. So how is the planning going and what is the kind of the challenges as you see fit from the government's perspective? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this event. Uh, it's a uh, great opportunity to discuss on climate and uh, apparels. Um, as we were hearing, and we all know, in Paris declaration, it was uh, decided, or the whole globe came to a consensus that they will try their best to reduce uh, two degrees Celsius temperature, taking all necessary steps for doing that. And another commitment was that uh, uh, they will try hard to make it 1.5 degrees Celsius. But all we know, unfortunately, uh, the biggest carbon emitter, they told that uh, we don't want to follow this. Uh, in terms of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is one of the lowest carbon uh, emitter, which is less than 0.5 metric ton per uh, head per year. USA is uh, more than 16 metric ton per head. So we are uh, very, very less emitter, but even then. Bangladesh is very serious in terms of uh, reducing its uh, carbon emission by 5% and uh, with support 10%. Uh, in three areas, especially energy, transport, and industry. Uh, the, all these three sectors, they have planned how to reduce uh, this uh, 5%. Especially if we look into the industry, the garments. Now, here comes the energy efficiency. Our power division, they are telling that uh, as we uh, 
projected the demand will rise uh, for power consumption uh, it is not uh, uh, being happened so this is one of the proof that energy efficiency is very well done in the industries solar uh, power solar home system in bangladesh we are about 5 million uh, solar home system and one of the largest in the whole globe it grew very quickly now we are working for the industries the feed in tariff and uh, you see uh, uh, you see the opportunity is there that uh, industry can produce its electricity by solar they can consume it and they can exchange with the uh, uh, distribution entity so energy efficiency and also the uh, solar energy production also co-generation not only using the uh, boiler gas for one purpose but uh, we are trying to put a specific target that energy efficiency should be about 75 to 80 percent which was earlier below 50 percent so all these I believe uh, will work together but uh, from the government other than this industry transport and electricity generation uh, you see we are trying to get the highest efficient uh, power plants cost will be higher but again the carbon emission will be the lower for mitigation program for adaptation program in all the area we are working you see huge tree plantation all over the country so with all these and the special targets with the industries and special with the government sector where they use the dye uh, specifically we are sitting with the private sector that how much they individually targets to reduce their emission thank you very much Okay, thank you very much for giving that perspective and also putting in perspective that uh, the baseline current levels of emissions are uh, still very low and uh, that is of course also that uh, expected growth in the power sector which will lead to emissions increase uh, if not done in the most efficient way. So there's a, a, a road to go and then accommodate growth while also having reductions in emissions is, is going to be a, a, a real challenge. Um, I would like to turn to um, uh, H&M, Pierre Borgeson, Head of Sustainability. Um, we have seen many sustainability initiatives, environmental initiatives in the past on chemicals, on water, on other issues. Now coming out on uh, energy efficiency and climate with uh, uh, joining also the, uh, the Charter. So I have basically I have uh, two questions. So first of all, is, uh, uh, how do you see the role of leading brands like yourselves, H&M, in the implementation of this uh, uh, Charter? And the second part is that uh, many in the, in the room or in the industry might feel that the commitment to be climate neutral by 2050 is already quite tough. And we have heard you this morning say that you will be uh, fast tracking this because you want to be climate neutral by 2030 and climate positive by 2040. So what is then the kind of the roadmap that you see ahead for uh, H&M and how can you get your supply chain, your, um, your producers on board with achieving this. Great, so thank you for welcoming H&M and myself on this panel. Let me start with the second question first and I'll come to the first after that because I think that's a better order on how I would like to present my company on this. So looking at the climate situation, I think it's needless to say that it's super important we all take action. Uh, business as usual, action as usual, politics as usual won't work for us here. Whether you look at it from a biodiversity perspective, from an environmental perspective, or an economic perspective. And we all here need to take action on it. 
I was asked before today, but what is actually driving H&M to put up a goal that is fast-tracking this? Uh, and I'll be very frank and give you the story behind. And it's a fairly simple, actually, exercise that we had in the company. Um, looking at the situation, it's clear that uh, the world has to commit to be well below uh, two degrees or below one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, and also looking at it, we need to do that before 2050 or 2050 at the latest. How we want to run our business and the value chain, uh, the partners that we work with, is to demonstrate leadership and invite others to be part of that journey. So, to put it easy, that means that we need to be contributing to less than one and a half increase and do it faster than 2050, actually. And that makes total sense for us. If we connect that to the product that we're putting out on the market, and I think obviously we're part of consumption when it comes to our business. Uh, from a consumption perspective, if we look at it from a social perspective, it can be very good of contributing to welfare developments. But from a resource perspective, from, a, from an environmental perspective, consumption has huge challenges. So when it comes to the fashion industry, which is a large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, we need to do a transformation. And that is what has been driving H&M to commit to a goal of climate positive value chain by 2040. And let me explain what that goal actually means. So H&M's own operation from an emission perspective is actually very, very small. Uh, the emissions that are coming from the stores and the offices that we are running is less than 1% if we look on our full value chain uh, approach. So having a climate positive approach, only looking at our own company, is not leadership. It's not changing the world and it's not changing the fashion industry. But having a value chain approach, so everything from uh, the raw material, the, the cotton seed, uh, the polyester making, which is uh, currently oil-based materials so connected to uh, emissions and such, to, to, to the other side of the value chain. So the usage of our product, uh, the washing, the laundry, the, 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 the ironing, and, and uh, the disposal, or even better, the actual the return of those fibers, the recycling of it. Uh, that we're also engaged in, is, is where we can make an impact and where we can uh, make a change. Um, if we dive into these different parts of the value chain, again, remembering that H&M's own operation is less than 1%, we find a large part of the emissions coming from the supply chain, but it's not the only part, and maybe this is a surprise to many of you, but actually approximately a fifth of the emissions are coming from the customer usage. So we need to work on that part as well. How do we motivate customers uh, to take care of the products in a different way? How do we work with different innovators, making it easier to take care of our products in a more environmentally friendly way when it comes to washing and such? And how do we, of course, enable those fibers to come back to uh, new garments? So circularity is very connected to this. Coming back to uh, the supply chain then, where a majority of the missions are. Uh, we can, of course, look into various different parts of it. The raw material, uh, or making that into a fabric, uh, which is, of course, connected to uh, dyeing, water-intense uh, processes and such, is something we absolutely need to focus on jointly. Uh, with the suppliers, with the civil society, with the government, when it comes to policy and incentives and purchasing practices. Uh, coming, coming, coming to a specific uh, area, which is also connecting to the climate charter, is the coal-fired boilers uh, that are in many suppliers. That stands for a huge part of the emissions uh, when it comes to the heating. And I'm, this is one example where it's positive for H&M and the partners that we work with to be part of the climate charter that has a commitment to phase out all 
coal-fired boilers or new investments in coal-fired boilers. Uh, it's an area where we need to work together with each other. I don't think it's enough with just signing a paper where we say that shouldn't be in business anymore. How do we work with each other as a collective industry uh, enabling that from, again, purchasing practices, from policies and, and best practices among suppliers? So with, with an agenda of, of bringing uh, uh, the garment industry to a climate positive initiative, it's super important to have uh, industry-wide collaborations and platforms to drive that change. And the climate charter is one of them that is focusing on policy, the policy level, which is an important part of this. Okay, thank you. The, I, I think that you're, uh, you're right. Uh, we need um, uh, sometimes uh, also challenges, the, the, the challenges which people would say in the initially it's impossible because the, the challenge of having something impossible will also spark innovation and you say that uh, people have difficulty to see how can it be climate positive. But that's also sparking the innovation to bring them people together and what you're saying that uh, this is also not something H&M or H&M in the supply chain can do alone. Very good input there. I mean, again, I forgot to say when it comes to our value chain approach, taking the cotton seed, the raw material to the customer usage, that full value chain, we want that uh, the, the, the reductions in greenhouse gases from that value chain should reduce to a larger extent than what they emit by themselves. That is what we mean with climate positive. Do we have the solution for that today? No, absolutely not. If we would have had that, we would have put 2020, not 2040. The world doesn't have a solution on that yet, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't set such a goal. If we set goals that are long-term, based on technology, based on know-how that we know of today, it's not bold enough, and it's not what the world needs from us as an industry. So, of course, it's absolutely needed that we come together for innovation, like you mentioned, for collaboration, for, for joint efforts on how we bring that forward and make that come to life. Okay, thank you. So we need innovation to get the deep cuts in the emissions, but uh, I think we also need to get all our manufacturers uh, on, on board with starting to do the, the obvious things. So the things which we already know can be done, like you say, uh, phasing out coal-fired boilers, doing the efficient uh, uh, lighting, uh, all other related issues. So this maybe brings me to uh, Rubana Hook, the president of the BGMA, um, to say that, uh, yes, you have, uh, as a voice of the... Uh, RMG industry here in, in Bangladesh, you've taken the bold step to become partner of the, of, the, uh, of the charter and commit to the charter goal for the, all your members. So what, how do you see, what do you see as the, from the BGMA perspective as the, the biggest challenges for achieving this across the board? Because we are talking about uh, leaders and leggers. So how can we bring everybody on board with this agenda? And uh, what, what will be then the role of the BGMA to do this? So what are the challenges? What is the role of the BGMA? Well, thank you. Um, I actually was very happy when Pierre just looked at me the moment he said, purchasing practices. And he looked at me and he didn't smile. So I think there's a, the biggest challenge uh, to sustainability is the, um, is the absolute disconnect between sustainability and sourcing practices. At a time when, and I wish I were 13 year old, I wish I was uh, Greta, who could actually look at the world, and especially the mature world, and say, how dare you? And I'm not saying this to you, but she, the little girl, actually told us this, asked this question, because we have acted irresponsibly. And I'm not saying that, you know, this is the time to still pursue the same route, but it's also a time when we should remember that the President of the biggest democracy, uh, Trump just walked away from Paris Agreement a few years ago. Uh, sorry, a few hours ago. It is also a time to remember. Yeah, he just walked away from Paris Agreement. It's also a time to remember that you know countries like Canada, um, though Trudeau has just said that you know he's just said that he's going to be very green, but they are the ones, including Norway, Guyana, and others, who are actually pursuing. Uh, crude oil production even more. Uh, so literally urging everyone to buy uh, more SUVs instead of uh, electric cars. 
So, a portion of the world is acting absolutely irresponsibly, whereas a portion of the Eastern world, um, like Bangladesh, is actually championing the cause. My point is, there are more than 110 LEED certified factories in this country. And why is the export still going down? Where is the conscience or the collective consciousness of the Western buyers who could be buying more from Bangladesh just because we are far greener than many other production units in the other part of the world? So I question the conscience. At a time when the gentleman sitting right next to me, Mr. Abul Kalam Azad, has been championing SDG goals. And yes, we look better, and he tirelessly fights for us. But the question is, is the industry on aligning our interests? But BGMA would love to bridge the gap. And you know, if brands need to talk to the government, if institutions or foundations need to align, we would be more than happy to do the matchmaking. But everybody must have one single goal, sustainability. And sustainability, when it comes to it, it cannot be just about environment and social. It has to be economic sustainability as well. Now, I have a full list of 12-page document of BGMA, which lists literally all the initiatives that we have aligned up with. The latest was signing up uh, to the UNFCCC charter. So we are absolutely aligned. I just, uh, uh, we met the, the German uh, minister for trade and, and Mr. Moller, and we just pledged that we would be pursuing his green button pledge. And we are committed to do that. And there is no dearth of um, interest or, or conviction in that. But we also must be equally incentivized there are so many factories going green. The government has given us a tax cut on green factories. What do we get from the, from the buyers who buy from us? Why are, are our quantities going down? Why are we still absolutely racing to the bottom? These are questions that need to be asked. So BGME, as far as we're concerned, I just mentioned uh, two initiatives. Apart from that, you've, we've been part of lots of other initiatives, including trees and others, and PACT is one of the leading ones, which basically uh, is contributing a lot, and you know, there are loads of initiatives that I can actually uh, list right now. But my humble appeal still would be that while Bangladesh marches ahead with the slogan of sustainability, we would urge all our partners to also hold our hands and, you know, speak in the same tone, in the same voice, because this was one field, getting green and going green, which was not prescribed by the buyers. We did it on our own. Yes, Accord and Alliance were all, they all came in. But the point is, the, only this initiative, and, and the reason why we went green is because we believe in it. We want to do good, look good, and feel good. But we also want to stay good. And if we want to stay good, we need the help of all the buyers. And it's not about only H&M and only one single buyer. There are tons of buyers who, who are actually violating. So though H&M is big with this, we should also kindly consider roping everyone else in with this. And I, I'll just conclude with one thing, and that's, uh, you know, there, there is a huge automation challenge. No matter what we say, it's going to hit us in about five to seven years or even 10. But we must be ready for that. So our latest tagline has been hashtag go human, go green. And I think that's the way to go. I think that's the collective um, voice of the industry. We would love to be a part of any green initiative in any, any sustainable practice that you would want us to be part of. But it must have a unified approach. So it must be aligned with the government at the same time, it also must look after the interest of the industry. Thank you. 
thank you very much, and that's uh, much appreciated. And I think that uh, uh, events like today's uh, Sustainable Apparel Forum are also meant to, uh, to really put a spotlight on, on many of the good initiatives. And we've uh, discussed earlier this afternoon already uh, some of the procurement practices, that, uh, the purchasing practices uh, to, to address that as a bottleneck, not just from an environmental perspective, but also in terms of the social domain and, uh, and disclosure areas. Um, I think uh, that, that uh, what is clear that, uh, that there's, there's, there's progress in some areas and we should recognize that, but we should also look for areas where additional improvements are there and uh, the, the, the lead certified factories is of course looking at the building envelope. What can we then do in what is happening inside the box in terms of the process efficiencies that could be achieved? So I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a picture where uh, some progress is definitely there, but I would also like to the audience or others to come in that we see some progress, but how can we accelerate that is not uh, that that we get this as, a, as an industry-wide initiative of all the garment manufacturers, all the, the, uh, the garment value chain in, uh, in Bangladesh. I uh, wonder whether um, any of the other panelists would like to come in and comment first on what the others have uh, observed, and otherwise then we can also uh, ask for the, the room for some questions. Would you like to respond, Jens? Um, you know, maybe just just a, a quick one also just to iterate on what I mentioned before the necessity to get the industry on board and then of course you were mentioning industry uh, interests are very important um, I, I couldn't agree much more because um, what we are aiming for with the goals of the Paris Agreement is basically a, a full transition of economies of industries of low emission uh, economies of, of resilient societies so definitely um, industries and people are, are in the center of the goals of the of the uh, Paris Agreement um, and you mentioned um, one of the leaders of the biggest uh, economy of the world just walked away and yeah it's true uh, the US just yesterday announced or signed off that they want to leave the Paris Agreement that just also tells me because we see a lot of climate action nevertheless never despite the, the federal government leaving the Paris Agreement there's a lot of activities even in the US in in non non state actors meaning states cities industries associations so it's very important and that's also part of our work to to get these non-state actors much closer to the process because the climate negotiations and countries' commitment is one thing, but they won't be able to do this full transition alone. That's um, why these kind of, of uh, industry initiatives are, are very important for us. And uh, once again, it's really a, a massive challenge in front of us and uh, the time is, is uh, getting really short as, as we've learned we, we need to transition in the in the next uh, 20, uh, 10 something years um, the com consumers um, choice I think I mean for me it's it's the first time um, I'm, I'm visiting uh, Bangladesh uh, and I've learned a lot also with uh, discussions where I had with colleagues yesterday and today um, I'm, I'm totally astonished and, and surprised and very positively um, uh, surprised of all the activities that are happening in the country, especially on the, the lead certification and energy efficiency. Um, I, I just think, and it's been mentioned a couple of times in this afternoon, that maybe it's not promoted enough. It's also one of the uh, pillars of, of such uh, charter is con uh, discussions with consumers and awareness raising. Um, I, I just think it will pay off uh, eventually because uh, you will have a, a competitive advantage in the, in the, in the midterm or I, I just think it may need more, more awareness with the consumer. Could I just say yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So when I mentioned Greta, I was actually, uh, what I meant was, you know, we've caused it, yeah. so we might as well solve it. Yeah. And you know, denial it cannot be a strategy. For sure. So we can't be in denial. That's for one. So as far as we are concerned from BGMEA, what we are trying to do is we are trying to map three kinds of factories. Um, first is, you know, uh, those who we will just educate on pollution control 
and aware just creating general awareness. The second tier would be on climate action. So obviously with more, you know, recycling and everything. And the third one is actually climate positive. So more of a circular economy. So there are all three types of factories in Bangladesh. It's just that we've never mapped them properly. So we're trying to form a, a national initiative called the RMG Sustainability Council, which will not only be looking at just the structural, electrical, and fire aspects of it, we have added two more components to it. We sincerely believe that without labor and without environment, we will never be sustainable. So I just wanted to assure you that you know we are absolutely on track, and there is nothing that we won't do to correct situations. All I ask is that you know the entire uh, sustainability concept has to be internalized. Yeah. It must be internalized. It must sit within the pricing structure. We must be prioritized and incentivized just because we are a better country, actually probably the best amongst all the manufacturing countries that uh, any brands have, who deserve uh, more orders, more value addition. And if you don't do it, then you know very soon we will be very discouraged. And it's not just about the big ones. It's also about the small ones. The government has a, a, a program called A2I, Access to Innovation. It is under the ICT ministry. So BGMA has actually thrown an innovation challenge to A2I, and they're already working with it only on sustainability. And there has been considerable progress there. So just to assure you once again, we are on track and we are progressing. Yes. Um, I want to share another piece of information. I believe all you know that in last September, uh, even Secretary General, uh, he called upon all the uh, head of the states to declare additional uh, uh, reduction in carbon emission. Uh, but uh, the picture was not very good. Uh, even Secretary General uh, frustratedly find that uh, very less uh, commitment was there. There was a special climate uh, change uh, uh, seem, conference uh, in even General Assembly. In terms of Bangladesh, the question of sustainability, as Ms. Rubana uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, telling about, uh, not only uh, uh, in terms of climate, in terms of uh, uh, you see, efficiency, uh, we need to look into beyond the uh, uh, you see, climate change. Because uh, we need to look into the fourth industrial revolution. That's a different chapter. But that time, uh, when, uh, as and when you start implementing the uh, uh, robotics, robots, uh, 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 blockchains, machine language, and all these. So you need to consume much more electricity in terms of less using the manpower. So here is another challenge we have. So we need to look into that also. Uh, that only, not the climate change issue. The sustainability issue is uh, how to uh, uh, make our uh, production cost more le less. Uh, and uh, more competitive in the global market. Uh, none of the uh, global champions, they will give you more money. They are not going to. But uh, the question is, you need to snatch money from him. He is not, he is not going to give you, uh, 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 in, in general terms, uh, business as usual. So we need to create such, such a situation that we are more competitive. Uh, in which way? In terms of energy efficiency and in terms of, again, support from the government, how we can be more efficient. I was talking with some of the young friends before coming to DAS, that uh, our labors, are they uh, 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 efficient enough for uh, competitive production? We need to look into this also, how to make them more efficient. Thank you.
we need to snatch money in which way that um, this is the global demand 4.5 million workers in bangladesh and uh, we are going green we are uh, adopting the highest uh, standard of environmental aspects so obviously we need green price uh, the green factory green production green price uh, obviously uh, my my uh, idea is uh, why don't you put a special tag on the products of a garment which has the uh, uh, green manufacturing uh, processes so i believe the whole globe will be ready to spend extra money for that garment if one garment is a general garment and if another is the green so put a st uh, sticker on green so i believe the whole globe is ready to spend more money my idea is please try to find out innovative ways how to encourage the green industries locally and also internationally thank you So there are many topics to touch upon here, and I will touch upon a few of them uh, to spare some time also for questions and such. And I will start uh, with applauding uh, the industry in Bangladesh to having a lot of lead certified factories. I represent a brand that has grown in Bangladesh, and we will, Bangladesh will continue to be a very important market for us. That is also why it's very important for us to understand how the continued growth will look like in Bangladesh. And I'm very keen to work together with uh, BGMEA to understand how that growth plan will look like in terms of resources, in terms of water situation when it comes to the ground water, in terms of waste management, in terms of industrial relationships when it comes to the workforce and how wages will develop. And of course, also purchasing practices for the brands and how we are to relate to each other as business partners. H&M has committed to work on our purchasing practice within the Initiative Act. Uh, and we will, of course, continue to do so. Coming to um, what you mentioned about putting a green tag and uh, relating it to the price, we have done that for a long time. Uh, and I will say two things here. H&M works strategically with our best partners. Uh, and you have to perform on various uh, uh, components in order to achieve a higher ranking within our supplier relationship management, where sustainability is a crucial part of that. And of course, if you do have practices, uh, and that goes for many different areas, quality is a very important piece, durability is a very important piece when it comes to sustainability as well. So if you perform well, you are earning with H&M a higher grade in our supplier relationship management which will enable you to uh, larger production, uh, stable, uh, uh, more stable planning, and so on. I guess that bell uh, is, uh, is to start cutting off. Uh, but of course, the investments that we have in sustainability office is huge when it comes to our company. Our commitment to only have recycled or more sustainable materials, uh, where we only have recycled or sustainable cotton by 2020 and all materials by 2030 are huge investments that we want to be leading the industry forward. There are many, many more things to say, but I assume we need to spare some time. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I think we got the uh, silent, but uh, um, well, it's more silent than in the morning, the warning that we need to wrap up. So I, w I would maybe make a, a few observations. I think that it's clear that we, we have a call for action for all. So it's the manufacturers, it's the buyers, the brands, it's also the consumers who perhaps don't immediately associate fashion with a high impact on climate change, which is, a, I think, is also still a perception problem. And what you're saying is also that we need to, to appeal also to the policymakers and the people who are planning for growth of the sector. What are then the resource requirements and how can we uh, deal with climate? So, so I think the call for action is clear. And it's also clear that we are, uh, what the, the Secretary General is saying, that it seems like climate change is something that we can win, but we are about to lose if we don't take more action. And in that sense, it's also clear that we cannot just bang on one 
uh, bet on one horse, we need to do a comprehensive approach uh, to, to look at the, uh, the, the, the factories, to look at the processes, energy efficiency, resource efficiency, renewables, and so on. I, I tend to come from a bit of a practical background, and I think yeah, we have a lot of informational things that can be done, so why can't we get some of the good practices which exist mainstreamed and scaled up and speed up. So uh, there is some, which Pierre, you were also referring on things that we don't know yet, but there's a lot that we know. Uh, what can we do there? And I think that there is some things which are basically linked to a lack of knowledge. What can we do there to bring everybody on board? There are things where, where there's maybe still some investment risks. So what can we do a market transformation also in terms of not just the procurement practices, but how we supply solutions, the energy efficiency solutions, the renewable energy technologies. How can we make it cheaper to do the right thing uh, for uh, the manufacturers? And then, of course, we have the, the call for innovation because the end game, we don't know. We need to do that. Okay, I'm, I get now also a bell to remind me, so I would like to thank all uh, the panelists uh, and also the audience. Unfortunately, not much chance to interact, but uh, I hope you found this interesting, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to request you to um, stand so that they can take a group photograph. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived to the seventh and last presentation of our event. At this segment, Mr. Gopalakrishnan Padmanabhan, Managing Director, APAC ME GVCI, will share his insights on the next challenges for a sustainable and green RMG industry in Bangladesh. GBCI is the only certification and credentialing body within the green business and sustainability industry to exclusively administer project certifications and professional credentials of LEED, EDGE, GRESB, PARKSMART, PEER, SITES, TRUE and WELL. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Gopala Krishnan Padmanabhan, Managing Director, APAC, ME GBCI, at the podium. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. In fact, uh, let me thank uh, Mr. Mustafis of uh, Sustainability Apparel Forum and Rubel and uh, the personal leadership of uh, Dr. Rubana from BGME. Uh, so I represent uh, USGBC uh, and we own the brand LEED. Uh, so we have been in the industry for the last 25 years and uh, LEED actually has uh, provided a program to measure and define a green building, communities, and cities. And uh, so LEED is an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And uh, uh, people talked about the energy efficiency in the last panel. So just to clarify, I think LEED is a program which not only talks about energy, but also water, waste management, uh, uh, human experience and carbon footprint as well. So that's the uh, thing we have, we have actually gone into. Uh, I think more importantly, I think uh, LEED has now become an economic value proposition because uh, LEED buildings are now shown savings in energy and water. So something like 30 to 40% of energy is saved in a LEED building compared to a non-LEED building. 
uh, and also you actually see the employee productivity increase as well. Uh, we operate in 175 countries, but I think uh, the, the most important thing is about Bangladesh. I think doc Dr. Rub uh, Rubana talked about the lead factories. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that in Bangladesh, we have close to 600 projects with lead, uh, out of which 120 are lead certified and more are coming. And uh, given the fact that Bangladesh has been one of the fastest growing economies in the last 10 years, uh, at an average of 8% every year, we actually see that the future is going to be very green. So I'm just putting a perspective because one of my agenda is to make sure that I also talk about what is next for Bangladesh, what is next for RMG uh, as, an, as, an, as an industry. So I think one of the important things we saw in Bangladesh was the effort of the government. I think as uh, Mr. Abul said, uh, I think green actually gets an incentive from the government as well. It is part of your national policy as well. In fact, the seventh five-year plan talks about a green and sustainable economy as well. And uh, the Ministry, Ministry of Environmental and Forests, Bangladesh Bank, the Central Bank of Bangladesh, and now recently the Ministry of Housing, Public Works, all actually have sustainability as a core theme. Uh, but at the same time, I think one of the important things we strongly believe is partnership. Uh, I think the last panel discussion was a very interesting one where they talked about partnership and leadership. And in Bangladesh, we are very actually fortunate to have BGME as one of our partners. Uh, uh, so are the other agencies like ITCOL and BKME, etc. Uh, so one of the efforts we are also doing uh, from an international perspective is to talk about the story of this to the rest of the world. So in the last few years, uh, I think we have worked in the media in Bangladesh. And in the next few years, uh, we are planning to actually talk about how we can actually message this to the rest of the world as well. I think in the panel discussion, you talked about how this needs to be promoted, how the brands across should know what exactly Bangladesh has been doing, right? So these are some of the media interactions we have actually done in the past. Now let me talk about what is next from a sustainability green perspective. Uh, so what we did last year from a lead perspective was to actually bring materials into lead. Uh, I think uh, possibly I think the, the H&M uh, person was talking about supply chain. So what we have now done is any building or city or community wanting to go for lead, they have to necessarily use materials which also show environmental product declaration, which means how much of energy and water they have used in the manufacturing, whether it is cement or, or a carpet or, 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 or a furniture which is used inside a building, they need to showcase this, which means we are pushing the green back to the supply chain as well. And that's something which uh, I think the, the, the buyer brands uh, you know, uh, should know about. So when you are actually buying from a, let's say a green factory, it is just not about a building. It is about the entire supply chain going green as well. So that's something which we are implementing. Uh, somebody talked about industry 4.0. I think we talk about technology. So what we are now doing is we are fairly clear that data transparency is very important. So, and somebody talked about performance, right? So today what we have done is we have launched a new technology platform for monitoring the performance of a building or asset live, which means every factory uh, in Bangladesh, RMG factories or buildings can now feed live data. It can be energy data, water data, waste data, uh, it can be the, you know, the, the air quality inside a factory. It can be the carbon footprint of the people inside. All that can be fed into a technology platform, and then you can actually see a live carbon score. I think so somebody talked about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, think, I think one of the buyer brands talked about the fact that the performance should be continuous. That's exactly what we are doing. So it is just not a one-off exercise. It is not a certification. It's about continuous performance. Uh, so, and you can do, a, and, and the factories here, or even the buyers, you can actually do a lot of analysis with this, right? I mean, what is the energy per employee, energy per square feet, energy per machine, what is the waste generation per square feet, and you can, uh, you can actually do asset level portfolio benchmarking as well. And uh, so a lot of analytics can go into it, so I'm actually rushing in, in, uh, because of the time constraint. So we already have 1 billion square feet under this platform, and I'm happy to say that uh, a particular green factory, I'm not, I'm not taking the name, has all, in Bangladesh already used this platform to go green. So my congratulations to them. Now, let me just end with this. So I think somebody talked about climate neutrality. So what we did 
was to launch a brand called Lead Zero, right? So what it does is that it's able to push a factory or a city or a community into a zero platform, right? So it can be zero on energy, you can be zero on water, you can be zero on carbon, and that's going to be defining the Bangladesh for the future. Uh, last but not the least, we've also launched a new program called Lead for Cities and Communities. So the advantage is in Bangladesh, you have a lot of EPEs and SEs that's coming in. So we are working with the government, we're working with the private developers to make sure that these sites also are LEED certified at a site level. So that when a garment factory is coming in, it is very easy for a building to go LEED as well. And we are firmly attached to the SDGs. I think the last speaker spoke about it. Uh, we have 138 projects in the LEED for city communities. We are going to get three more from Bangladesh shortly. Uh, it can be applied to a new city or an existing SEZ as well. Uh, uh, and last but not the least, I think one of the things we're doing in Bangladesh is to work with the universities very closely. So all the architectural students and the engineering students in Bangladesh, we are working with them, we are taking them through education, exams, and capacity building so that they can support the sustainable in initiatives for the future. So, so finally, it's all about people, it's all about messaging. So one of the things I think uh, we spoke about with BGME is how to actually take this story to the rest of the world. So we are, we are going to actually do some joint branding, joint messaging platform so that the world will come to know what Bangladesh has done with respect to green and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to wrap up the whole day's event with the expert comments from industry leaders. This second edition of Sustainable Apparel Forum has focused on sustainability in the apparel industry through policy and leadership in Bangladesh. To put closing remarks on our drive to build a more sustainable apparel manufacturing hub in Bangladesh, today we have a panel of hugely experienced visionary personalities. We have here the gracious presence of our chief guest, Mr. Tipu Munshi, MP, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Commerce Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, his Excellency H.G.J. Harry Verwaij, Ambassador, Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands of Bangladesh, Dr. Rubana Huck, President of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, Mr. Ziaur Rahman, Regional Country Director, Production, Bangladesh, Pakistan and Ethiopia, H&M, and Mr. Mostafi Zuddin, Founder and CEO of Bangladesh Apparel Exchange. I would like to request all of them to please come up on the stage and take their seats, please. Requesting Dr. Rubana Huck to please come up on stage as well. First, I would like to request Mr. Zia Rahman, Regional Country Manager, Production, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Ethiopia, H&M, to please come up and say a few words on this occasion. Thank you so much. Before I start, I want to correct a little bit. My position is 
regional country manager, not country director. Uh, Honorable Commerce Minister, Mr. Kipu Munshi. Honorable Ambassador, Mr. Harry. Honorable BGM President, Ms. Rubana Hawk. Mr. Mustafis, my friend and brother. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and very good evening. I'm very delighted and proud to be part of the second Sustainable Apparel Forum. I want to start with our simple business idea. Fashion and quality are the best price in a sustainable way. And I want to quote our head of sustainability, man, head of group sustainability, Ms. Anna Gather's comment, which is, we want to use our size and skill to lead the change toward fully circular and truly sustainable fashion. H&M Group sustainability work is integrated in our culture and values. We believe in a long-term approach is a must when it comes to dealing with complex sustainability issues. And we work to ensure that sustainability is integrated into all aspects of everything we do. At H&M Group, we consider the need of present and future generations and are aware that our entire business must be conducted in a way that is economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable. This is why we set a clear ambitions and bold goals. For example, by 2040, H&M Groom aimed to have a climate positive value chain. Our value chain is connected to countless people, communities, ecosystems, and other business around the world. That's what it means to be part of the global economy. Our business social, environmental, and economic impact is significant, and we want to, to be positive as possible. As a large global company, we have a responsibility toward all our 177,000 colleagues and also 1.6 million textile workers around the world which are working in our supply chains. We believe all workers should be treated with respect and to be able to enjoy a safe and healthy workplace. All textile workers have the right to have a fair living wage and we will continue to use our size to bring about the lasting changes. Improving wages is a challenge that concerns the whole industry and uh, we need to take it to on a collectively and a scale and encourage others to do the same. That is why we have a clear strategy to create the best precondition for live, fair living wages. I have been asked why H&M is joining in Sustainability Apparel Forum. The answer is very simple for me. It's not a job for a single company or a person, nor a single stakeholders. Partnership, shared knowledge, collaborations are the key to success. We believe it's a shared responsibility and everyone has a vital role to play. We are amazed to find the work of Mr. Mustafi and Bangladesh Apparel Exchange. We see that we can complement each other by joining second sustainable apparel forum. The retail industry has changed significantly. We also notice a customer shift from a physical store to online shopping. At the same time, sustainability offer become far more important as customer offer. Today, customers want to know how the product has been produced, what was the working conditions, how the people behind the products were treated, how it created impacts on mother nature. You like it or not, we still have one planet to live. I am proud to say at H&M, sustainability is a business decision process. Today in Bangladesh, we have more than 120 ETP that are green, which cover 97 of our sourcing from Bangladesh. All our suppliers have electric worker participation committee, where women participation is more than 40%. We have 19 factories where we have active union. All this credit goes to our suppliers. We are truly proud of being part of the journey in Bangladesh. We are here for the last 27 years, and our commitment are getting more stronger by joining with the ACT, Action, Collaboration, Transformation. We see 
more opportunities here if we collaborate together. We are happy and confident to find local initiative like BGME has started RSC. I will repeat our goal for 2040, where we want to be climate positive. I believe to become a leading sourcing destinations, we really need to look into our energy policy, water policy, worker rights, working condition, as well as wages. I really, I really want to thank today's speakers, panelists, participants for their thoughtful advice, and most importantly, a great intention towards sustainability. I'm fully convinced and inspired that sustainability is a business case. As you, but not at the last, I want to highlight, if we want to take the lead in the world apparel sector, I believe three major areas that are need to be emphasized, which are product development, efficiency, and sustainability. I am 100% convinced that all our Bangladeshi local entrepreneurship and positive approach of the government, we will be able to overcome these challenges. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to request Dr. Rubana Haq, President of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporter Association, to please come up and say a few words on this occasion. Thank you, but I thought I just spoke in the last panel. So I don't know what else to say, except for also drawing your attention to uh, the current uh, marketing campaigns done by different brands, like Patagonia, for instance. Patagonia actually has... Uh, brought out a huge poster, I, I think most of you are aware, and they have posted their jackets, one of their jackets, and they've written, um, don't buy it. So, there are also brands which are encouraging mending, reusing, recycling, and as a result, uh, consumption is bound to go down. Now, what is more important is what we need to figure out, whether buying less with more value makes sense, whether buying less with more value addition and more thought process and more heart makes nations and industries sustainable is something that we need to consider. So if we go the Patagonia way, and I believe that should be the way, then we are going to lose out on quantities. And, and the only thing that's probably only going to matter is value addition. How do we go there? So. In spite of all the unacceptable behavior of America pulling out of Paris Agreement, in spite of many purchasing practices um, of, of brands which are also unnamed and unspotted, uh, we still are a country and we have to cater to all of them. Uh, so it's not just about H&M uh, or a few a uh, few brands because you know there are others so purchasing practices also must be standardized I just heard Zia talking about act I would just humbly like to add that you know uh, even when you talk about act how do you really make all the buyers accountable are all the buyers in act uh, geared up for taking this mass challenge of standardizing their practices I wouldn't think so. Uh, if not, then what is the answer? And you know, I, uh, we also have, when we talk about sustainable production and consumption, there are many factories, and, and you do know that we have more than 100 lead factories, certified factories, which are here. And, and we all know that in order to have resilient economies, we need to have sustainable productivity and production. Many of our machineries are actually uh, much more efficient now. And many small factories, including uh, the ones that H&M or any other big brands or retailers don't trade with, even they are conscious. I was actually surprised to spot a small factory um, who was in one of our innovation discussions. And he said, you know, madam, what I do, I do little things. Like, I just have an extra ring um, under the tap um, 
and, and that's it. That, that sort of, you know, regulates and, and, and does not encourage waste of water. These are simple homegrown solutions. So what I was trying to stress on was homegrown solutions, which could be standardized and adapted and adopted uh, by the brands. Um, also about, you know, the solar PV life cycle. Let's also think about that. I mean, what is the life cycle? And when it ends, how much waste does it also cause? So there are lots of uh, dichotomies in even the discourse of sustainability that needs to be, of course, readdressed. Um, I don't think I'm going to add much more, but let me again, once again, stress on a few things that I spoke about in the last panel. Um, they are repeat, uh, they're something that probably need uh, to sink into the psyche of the, of the buyers. Very humbly, once again, um, we need to make sure that we are paid better prices. I mean, yes, we need to be efficient. We need to be reducing our wastes. Yes, we need to be sustainable. I do not disagree with any of that. But at one point or the other, uh, those who source must also kindly bring upon themselves to self-audit, to self-monitor, and to correct and remediate their purchasing practices, because not all is fair what goes on. So I appeal to your conscience, I appeal to the fairness of the buyers, and I, I can only say that, you know, we can only do this much, but to take us to the next level, we will absolutely actively need the support of the Western world and just having sustainability discourses and telling us how good we need to be is not going to be the solution. If the solution has to come, it has to come from all the ends, including the buyers and the suppliers. It cannot be a unilateral imposition on the suppliers. And that's actually all I wanted to say. Um, I hope uh, the message is very clear. H&M is, is very much here. I don't know how many other brands are there. But uh, somehow Bangladesh seems to be always the testing ground for anything ground-breaking. I don't think there are other countries which are often given this opportunity, let me be more positive, opportunity of, of being trial grounds. But it, but it is also, uh, on other hand, it, it's also sad because we can't be the testing ground for everything you must also make sure that the other players in the region, outside the region, globally, are on the same page and that we are not the only one complying. Because at the end, we are the lowest emitter. Um, therefore, we should be not penalized at all and we should be absolutely blessed by your orders and by your trust and by your companionship and partnership, of course. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Rubana Huck. I would like to request His Excellency HGJ Harry Verwaj, Honorable Ambassador, Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands of Bangladesh, to please come up and remark on the Sustainable Apparel Forum 2019. Um, dear panelists, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to start by thanking the Bangladesh Apparel Exchange and the BGMEA and Mr. Mustafiz Udin and Dr. Rubana Haq in particular for organizing this important, important event. I believe this event is very timely as the apparel supply chain globally continues to be scrutinized for sustainability issues. Thank you for making the Sustainable Apparel Forum 2019 a success. With representatives from the government, experts, brands, policymakers, donors, trade unions and manufacturers from more than 20 countries, I am truly impressed, impressed by the sheer size and impact of these events. The Netherlands is honored to be a title sponsor for this event and leading the discussion on sustainable purchasing practices. The problems that we discussed here are real. Just imagine 4 million workers in Bangladesh producing garments and fashion for millions of consumers, often on the other side of the planet. What happens in between manufacturing 
and consumption remains a black box to many. We might be talking of unauthorized subcontracting, workplace safety issues, and environmental pollution as just some examples of issues that are still prevalent in the value chain. Ladies and gentlemen, the pressure to act is upon us towards production where human rights violations and environmental damage is no longer condoned. A new imperative norm. Sustainable value chains concern the well-being not only of this generation, but of many more generations to come. This year's forum is the important opportunity to talk about solutions. To ensure that we leave a legacy to the next generation of which we may be proud. The problems that require solutions are complex. One stakeholder can achieve very little just alone. Governments are scrutinized to regulate, even outside their own borders. Companies are expected to produce sustainably wherever in the world they operate. And I believe for this we need durable partnerships. The consumers expect us to be credible and responsible. So most responsible citizens in your markets today do not want to buy products that are made by children or that seriously harm the environment. They expect us to be re responsibly sourced. They feel to have a right to fair products produced without human rights violations and environmental damage. But where responsible citizens expect all of this, once those same individuals change over to become choosy consumers, their attitudes often change. Other considerations come to the fore. Although an increase in awareness of sustainability issues is observed, progress on consumer awareness is still too slow. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm especially happy to take note of the participation of AGT, the Dutch Agreement on Sustainable Garments and Textile in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, industry associations, trade unions, NGOs, and the government form the coalition that commits itself to address and prevent abuses such as life-threatening work conditions, child labor, and modern slavery. This is essential because these human rights violations still exist throughout the entire clothing supply chain. And this is also relevant to Bangladesh considering the size of its garment sector. The conditions of Bangladesh's garment workers and the economic future of the country are inherently linked. Partnerships are only helpful if they operate effectively. And over the past two days, we have witnessed world-renowned experts and key stakeholders explore solutions in partnership. A truly sustainable garment value chain can only be achieved if sustainability issues are taken into account in the sourcing process. There is a growing need for long-term partnerships where responsibilities and power structures are assessed and adapted to be more equal across all stakeholders. Those include the final consumers or end users, retailers, distributors, manufacturers, and suppliers in the garment value chain. So while moving towards a more sustainable methods may increase costs up front, in the long run, however, doing so will spur innovation, guard against supply chain shocks, and enhance corporate reputations. With increasing consumer attention on sustainability issues, businesses adopting sustainable methods may expect an improved corporate image. That might in turn build up a brand loyalty and pro promote revenue growth. All these considerations and efforts could just feel comfortable on paper but without a creative way to engage customers to take part and to put their passions into actions, it will be in vain. This came out very strongly in the roundtable that we organized at the Embassy on purchasing practices. There are many ways to enhance consumers' understanding on sustainable products and to enable customers and businesses alike to make smart choices to improve purchasing and sourcing practices. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's forum strengthened my confidence that the sustainable garment sector is possible. Let us work in the upcoming years to reap the benefits of the seeds planted yesterday and today. 
we strive for a truly sustainable and compliant value chain that will fuel Bangladesh's economic growth, creating jobs and fostering social progress for women and men alike. This joint determination to cooperate, to me, is a win-win strategy, a strategy that allows economic opportunities to expand and by creating economic growth and jobs for women and men alike. We need this strategy to allow Bangladesh to brand itself better and more professionally. The label Made in Bangladesh will be a proud sign of the world's best and most compliant garment industry. In addition to expand and brand, I call upon all of you involved to stand. So what does that mean? To stand with Bangladesh means joining hands to make the year 2020 the year of transition to uphold and to strengthen the progress achieved so far. Expand, brand, stand. So ladies and gentlemen, this special transition year 2020 marks the transition of the Bangladesh Accord to the RMG Sustainability Council, RSC. It is my hope and expectation that the RSC will play the crucial role in ensuring continued workplace safety. RSC's successful operation will send a strong signal to the world, being that Bangladesh has absorbed and is taking over the strong legacy that the court will be leaving behind. A signal that a truly sustainable garment industry in Bangladesh will be self-evidently for real. To conclude, I feel we can all still do more and still do better. Without an intensified and concerted effort, a common understanding and a united front among producers, traders, designers, consumers, and regulators, all the above would just be that paper exercise. But knowing your interests, your passion, and your commitments, I'm confident that we will march on together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Ambassador. At this stage, I would like to request our chief guest, Mr. Tipu Munshi MP, Honorable Minister, Ministry of Commerce, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, to please come up for his speech. Your Excellency, Mr. Harry Warwick, Ambassador, Embassy of the Kingdom of Netherlands, Bangladesh, and a great friend of Bangladesh, and also friend of this trade, I think. Dr. Rubana Hawk, President of the Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association. This is for the first time, the way, the way our country lead, leader, Sheikh Hasina, opposition leader, Another also speaker. Now, we our trade has got one more lady in this. Rubana Hawk, doing very good. Mr. Gia Rahman, <coughs> regional country manager, production, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Ethiopia. H and M. It's good to see my country man has become the regional country manager. It's really our pride. <laughs> Distinguished chief ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be here at this, this closing session of the second sustainable apparel forum. I thank the mastermind of this event, Mr. Mustafa Uddin, the founder of Bangladesh Apparel Exchange for his outstanding efforts and dedication for the industry. We should all try from our own position to inspire positive change in our industry. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you all know that the apparel industry started this journey in Bangladesh in early 80s. I started my garment industry in 1985. So it is almost 35 years. It's a long way. As we kept 
growing, we started facing many new challenges and many crossroads from child labor elimination in 1995 till today. We are adopting many positive changes in the area of compliance, safety, and well-being of our workers. <clears throat> Over the last four and a half years, we made massive efforts in transforming the industry in terms of safety inspection, remediation of factories, capacity building of institutions, and improving workers' rights. As we all know that after this Rana Plaza problem, full scenery all changed. So after that, the new journey has started, and we changed a lot. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, is extremely supportive to the workers. As per her instruction, the minimum wages of the garment workers was increased by 381% since 2010, and from, from 1662.5 taka to 8,000 taka now. I want to remember one thing in 1998, 20 months back, I was Vice President of BGMEA. That time, Honorable Prime Minister told me, what you are doing for the female workers? Are you going to make home for them, dormitory for them? I remember till that, when she was first time in the, as a Prime Minister, that time also she told to do something for the women workers. So I want to remember that thing also. In recent years, our apparel industry has made extraordinary progress in the area of environment, friendly industrialization. <coughs> Sorry. We now, we now have 101 LEED certified green factories, of which 25 are platinum rated LEED green factories. 500 more factories are in the, are in the pipeline for getting US GBC certification. Our factories are increasingly advancing toward sophisticated technologies which are important for desired growth of RMG industry. Most of our new generation factories are equipped to handle top quality products of diverse styles and innovation. So we have now a solid foundation in the area of sustainability. Despite all these efforts, it is unfortunate to see the continued negative propaganda against the industry. But we don't really see much in the media the, count, the countless positive initiative our factories are taking for well-being of their workers and community silently, like health center, fair price shop, free school for children. We have many stories in this industry which can, be, which, which can change the perception about the industry at home and abroad. So it is the time now to look at sustainability differently. We have, to, we have to also think about creating and enhancing economic op opportunities for these days and millions of workers by sending the right, by sending the right message about the industry. There are so many brands and retailers still not sourcing from Bangladesh. So I, en I encourage them to visit us see how we are progressing and impacting lives and take part in this journey. Now is the time to, time to also focus on the industry's capacity to innovation and value addition and to make our factories more efficient and competitive. Production diversification has already started. And we know all that, that in our industry and many of our factories are now producing high-valued garments and for the premium brands. But compared to the whole industry, it is still very insignificant. Moreover, online shopping is getting more popular and automation has created both challenges and opportunities for us. Technologies can significantly enhance our competitiveness and it also has some impact on the employment. Bangladesh's graduation to a middle-income country would also bring some challenges, 
some changes in tariff regime in our markets. We have to observe the whole dynamics and set our priorities accordingly. So, in this forum, I would urge our, I would urge our value buyers and local entrepreneurs to engage in more strategic step forward. Distinguished presence here. When we started our journey, no one ever thought that a country without any core raw materials and cotton could be a leading apparel exporter in the world. I remember when I started in a small room, maybe five to six thousand square foot. A lot of factories in Dhaka city was in uh, residential apartment and all this. I remember that days. But now, total scenario changed. But we have achieved beyond ex expectation. Now we have to prepare for the next growth phase where sustainability will be a major game change for us, changer for us. The government under the leadership of our, of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is taking very step, every step to bring desired economic prosperity for the nation. Our government is committed to facilitate trade and investment in our country. And I'm happy that such a forward-looking discussion is happening in this country. I really thank all the speakers of this forum. One small thing I want to mention it here. I mentioned it earlier. We have got more hundred, more than hundred green factories. Out of them, 25 platinum factories. All these things are happening now. A lot of green factories are in the pipeline. But one thing I want to mention, I don't see any green price for these things. We don't have very good price what, I, what should be, what should we deserve, what should we get. So in this respect, for sustainability, that can be, that is also to be, to be considered that green price also we need for our factories. I thank all the speakers of this forum and finally I thank the organizers and all the support, supporters of this event for this outstanding in, in, initiatives. Thank you very much. Thanks for all. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Now I would like to request Mr. Mostafizuddin, founder and CEO of Bangladesh April Exchange, to please come up for his closing remarks. Welcome, Chief Guest of Closing Session, Mr. Tipu Munshi, MP. Honorable Commerce Minister, Government of Bangladesh, a true friend and supporter of our industry, His Excellency Harry, Ambassador of the Netherlands to Bangladesh, our visionary leader, Dr. Rubana Huck, Honorable President of BGMEA, and my personal inspiration, a true advocate of sustainability, Mr. Jiao Rahman, H&M Regional Country Manager, Production, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Ethiopia. Designatees, journalists, friends, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening to all of you. I know it's been a long day. We have started early morning, 8 o'clock. You must be very tired. Your presence here is a great inspiration for me. First of all, I consider myself very fortunate to be a part of this journey towards sustainability of Bangladesh apple industry. We have organized this time the second Sustainable Apparel Forum. This time we had been 50 speakers from 11 countries shared their valued perspectives on the apparel sustainability in five panels. A total seven presentation on the sustainability issues had been given. On the occasion of the SAF HIG Index Manufacturing Forum for the very first time made their occasions in Bangladesh. We had two wonderful Roundtable on purchasing practices and water efficiency in 
Netherlands Embassy and Sweden Embassy. I would like to give you big thanks for arranging this. It was wonderful. I hope all of you who attend the event, you find what worthy. Thanks to the... Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful and great, uh, grateful for BGMA for co-organizing the event. This is the very first time we collaborate any event togetherly. And uh, I know, I'm sure quite uh, this, this came under the leadership of our Honorable President. I'm very proud of that. Thanks to the Embassy of Netherlands for the continuous support.
had been participated in the expo. As a part of the responsibility, Bangladesh Denim Expo is partly financing for this sustainable apparel forum. Though the staff is included uh, uh, today, the expo will be continued tomorrow. I will be requesting all of you, if you have managed some time, please visit it tomorrow. Fi finally, I would like to thanks to all my uh, team and colleagues who had made this event very successful. You guys work very hard. I'm very thankful to you. And also, I'm uh, all the, all the person who is associated with this event, including uh, the event guys, MCs, and everybody. I'm very, very grateful to all of you. And of course, to my wonderful family, who always helped me a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see in 2020. Is it the last one, or we'll continue? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mustafizuddin. And with that, we have come to the end of the closing plenary session. Thank you very much, honorable speakers. As you know, under the leadership of Mr. Mustafizuddin, Bangladesh Apparel Exchange has been taking initiatives to help Bangladesh apparel industry to face challenges regarding social, environmental, and business sustainability. In this regard, Bangladesh Apparel Exchange is going to organize two other grand events in the upcoming month of April 2020. These are the third edition of Bangladesh Fashionology Summit on 6th April 2020 and 12th edition of our flagship event, Bangladesh Denim Expo. We will also have the third edition of Sustainable April Forum of on 2nd of November 2020 as well as the 13th edition of Bangladesh Denim Expo. We would appreciate your kind cooperation and participants at the event as well. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our co-organizers of the second edition Sustainable April Forum Bangladesh Gar Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, BGMEA, as well as our valued sponsor, Embassy of the Kingdom of Netherlands ba to Bangladesh, H&M, CNA Foundation, Better Work Bangladesh, for partnering with us. You val your valued support has made this initiative possible. We also thank contributors of the second edition of Sustainable April Forum, IRBC, Agreements, Kingpin's Show, International Finance Corporation, European Union, Global Climate Action, ZDHC, UNIDO, Sustainable April Coalition, USAID, International April Federation, International Labour Organization, Ministry of Commerce, Bangladesh, GIZ, Embassy of Sweden, Ethical Trading Initiative, Embassy of Canada, Fairwear Foundation, FBCCI, Apparel Impact Institute, Sweden Textile Water Initiative, Bangladesh University of Textiles, GBCI, the Freedom Fund, Embassy of Denmark, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Dhaka North City Corporation, Dutch Bangla Chamber of Commerce and Industries, MNS, and Good Fashion Fund for all their cooperation. We also share our heartfelt gratitude to our speakers, experts, delegates, and other participants. Thank you all for your cooperation. Wish you all a very good luck. I would like to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that the Bangladesh Apple Exchange is the proud organizer of Bangladesh Denim Expo, concurrently taking place at Hall 4 of ICCB, just a few meters away from this auditorium. Please do not forget that you can visit the Expo with the same registration that you have done at Sustainable Apple Forum 2019. I would also like to mention that dinner and networking party has also been arranged at Hall 4. Please do make your way there, enjoy your meal, and have a very good night. Thank you very much.